Okay, my name is Ruth Fenton. I was born in Poland. And the following story is a tragic part of my life during the Holocaust. The city I was born is a suburb of one of the biggest cities, industrial cities in Poland, Lodz. The city where I lived was Brzeziny by Lodz. I was born to a very nice family. It was a very warm home. I had two brothers. And the years were passing by in a very warm atmosphere. My great, my great grandfather started a big industry in the same city and the city became known all, o all over the world. They were manufacturing men's clothing to send out to export. Would you also tell us your original name, your friend, before you married? Yeah, uh, I will finish this. Yes. Uh, the business was so successful that it became a tremendous industry and the whole city was involved in this industry. There were tailors and manufacturers. So we used to have always people coming from all over Poland to my father buying, uh, re uh, buying wholesale clothes for their stores. And they always had discussions. People were invited to our house for dinner. And they, we always had discussions about politics, about different things, what was going on in the world. Shortly before the war, in starting 1933, I was a young girl. I used to hear already what was going on in Germany, what was done to Jews. Jews were uh, deported, Jews were humiliated, Jew their property was confiscated. We knew what was going on, but we never realized what can happen to us. And really, the story which I'm going to tell started September 1st, 1939. This was when the Nazis invaded Poland. I was a teenage girl. I didn't know what to expect. I was very scared. One of my oldest brothers was uh, drafted to the Polish army. And I was with my older brother at home, and we, we were all worried very much. When the war started, September 1st, 1939, our city was bombed for three days. And from the, we were hiding in cellars, and from the blast, when it all ended, we were all deaf for a few days. This, half of the city was burned down, and a lot of people were killed. It was a terrible silence when the Wehrmacht, German Wehrmacht marched in. It was very quiet. Everybody was very, very scared. We were trembling. And we had reasons to do it because the next day everything started with the Jews. Every day was something else. They were catching people to very humiliating work. They arrested a lot of uh, wealthy people, intellectuals. Food started to be scarce. And people were running away because we could still go, you know, we could still go from city to city. It was so, such a chaos and we didn't know what to do. We just sit there. And this lasted for several months. Towards the end of 1939, a law came out for the Jews. We all had to live in one section of the city. They made a curfew. We cannot go out after 5 o'clock. And people, people had to move in some families, two families to one apartment and share the same kitchen. And it, from day to day, it got worse as far as food is concerned. 
after we moved into the ghetto, they uh, established factories, and we all had to work making uniforms, uh, parachuting uniforms for the German Wehrmacht. We worked from 1940 till, till spring 1942. We didn't have any news. We didn't have any papers. The radios we had, we had to turn in. And we, we really didn't know what's going on. We were, we were isolated from the whole world. In 19, but I have to go back. Is it okay? It's, it's very important. Now, before, before they closed the ghetto, the most horrible atrocities happened. They built a scaffold in the middle of the square, and they hanged 14 young Jews. The whole Jewish population, children, women, older people, uh, crippled, everybody had to go out and watch this. The bodies were hanging for three days, and they took pictures of it. And it was just horrible to describe our feelings when we saw this, what was going on. After this, they burned down the most beautiful synagogue in our town. The synagogue was built during the times of the Tsar by Italian artisans. And it Excuse was... Excuse me, during the times of what? The times of the Tsar. The Tsar. Yeah, Russia, the Russian Tsar. Or Russian Tsar. Za the Tsar, right. Uh, we call it Tsar. Tsar. Yeah. And approximately what year? Was I, that? I don't know. I wasn't alive at this time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Before World War I. Yes. And uh, re the synagogue was the cradle of our civilization there. Eh? And we were very, very hard and, and terrible. It was a terrible shock to the whole Jewish population. And this is the first time I saw my father crying when this happened. And shortly after this, they started with the ghetto. So we stayed in the ghetto for two years. We worked. We didn't have enough food already. In 1942, they asked us to leave the apartment and they assembled us outside, and they took us to a different ghetto, to get a lodge. We had to leave everything behind us just to take a little, a little luggage which we could carry. When we came to get a lodge, it was a terrible thing to see people walking around, very swollen people, very skinny people. Before the war, a lodge had uh, 650,000 population, and when we came, there were 100,000 Jews. People, they assembled people from different cities around lodge. So there were no more ghettos left. The only ghetto left was ghetto lodge. It was part of the city, and uh, it was also curfew, and we all had, had to go to work. A few months after we were in Ghetto Lodge, one day they surrounded this, the whole neighborhood where we used to live, and we all had to go out, and they grabbed people at random. At this time, they grabbed my father, and I never saw saw him anymore in my life. And later on we found we didn't know where they went. We didn't have the slightest idea. We just knew after the war that they took him to the concentration camp. To which one we don't know. Presumably, presumably, I don't know all Auschwitz. From 1942 till 1942, we worked and the food situation was terrible. We had about 800 calories a day. We were terrible hungry all the time. It came to the point I was eating uh, reddish leaves and, and all kinds of pills, uh, which really hurt the stomach, but we just ate anything we could get a hand of. 
You mean peels? Peels, right. Peels, like uh -huh. potato peels. Potato, pe potato mm. peels was a luxury. Yeah. This you had to get a special yes. permit. But we ate all kinds of peels. And uh, I had some of my friends coming to get a lodge, and they all died there, the majority from hunger, one by one. In uh, August 1944, they asked us again, it, it, the way it was organized, each factory had, had to come a certain day to a square, and they told us they are going to send us out to work in Germany. At this time, I was with my mother, because my father was gone already. This was August 22. 1944 and I was with my mother and we went with this transport to the train cattle trains it was terrible hot they packed in so many people we couldn't breathe and really being in the cattle train we kind of felt that something horrible is going to happen to us we didn't know what on one hand, we, we thought, well, they cannot, they cannot do anything to us. I mean, they did everything what they could already. They will send us to work, and we will work, and we will, somehow we will survive. But little did we know, we really didn't know a thing what was going to be. It took about two days or three days, I can't recall exactly, to come to Auschwitz. And while we were, while the train was moving very slow, people were fainting and people were hungry. And there were not sanitary uh, conditions like uh, toilets. And it was a terrible mess. It just was horrible. We didn't know the train was going slow and slow and slow. We did not have the slightest idea what directions we are going. Finally, we were coming close to a place. We saw miles and miles and miles and miles of electric wires. So many fences, high, high fences of electric wires. Hundred and hundred and hundred uh, little, little bungalows. All the same. Bungalows, 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 electric wires. All flat land. All dry, no tree, nothing. And suddenly we saw thousands and thousands and thousands of people. They didn't look like people. They looked very strange. We couldn't figure out what it is. What kind of objects. Mm -hmm. They had, uh, they, uh, bo they were bald headed, like their hair would be shaved off. They didn't have clothes, just uh, striped, striped uh, uniforms. And some were some rags. And the majority of them were barefooted. They looked terribly strange. We didn't know what it is. They didn't look like animals, but they didn't look like people. We couldn't figure out. And finally, they, the train stopped, and some people in these stripes, but very husky guys. It seems these people were there already for many years. They were dressed. I mean, they had shoes, and they looked pretty husky, pretty good. And they came over, assessment came over with dogs and with whips, and they started to scream, get out fast, get out, and leave all your belongings, leave all your belongings, you cannot take a thing with you. Right away we knew something worse is going to happen. It was a terrible chaos, children were crying, and the crippled people couldn't move around. And the other people just were shocked with all this and terrible tired from this horrible trip. Then they started to walk us. They started to walk us, walk, 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 walk. And then we saw some green grass and flowers and we heard an orchestra was playing. And they took us to some little buildings. They said they are going to uh, give us, you know, we have to take showers to get clean and they will give us 
different clothes. The orchestra, were the people also dressed in these uniforms or were they dressed differently? The orchestra people, do you remember? Uh, also in uniforms, yeah. They were from far away, but you could hear some marches playing. It was not a concert, like a march orchestra plays, and you saw green, you know, green lawns, little flowers, you know, bushes of flowers here and there, scattered some trees. Especially around, the, especially around the, where we went to the showers. But before we went, they, they made two lines. And uh, it seems they took, we didn't know what these lines mean at all. And my last word to my mother was, in Polish, I said, if they will separate us, in case they will separate us, so please don't worry. We will work and the war will end and then we will, we will be together. We're going to work, so let's not worry now. And while we came to the line, immediately I was separated from my mother. And then she went with, I was glad, oh, she's going with people I know. There was a lady who worked with me in the ghetto in the office with her little girl. There were some other few people, mothers with children, older people, big, 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 big lines. And when they separated me from my mother, I walked over to a young assessment who was standing with a machine gun, and I said, please, please, let me go to the other line with my mother. And I cried terrible. And I begged him. He, then he took the machine gun to my head. He said, get away, get to the other line. And I didn't have any choice. I went to the line where, I, where they put me to. And then they marched us to the place where we were supposed to take the shower. But before we came in, there were already young women which were prisoners before we came from Czechoslovakia and Hungary. And they stood there with scissors and uh, right away they cut off our hair completely, completely erased. And then, then we took the shower and then they gave us some old torn clothes. I got an old torn dress, no shoes, nothing. And all of us got the same treatment. Some got a better dress, some I wear. They just threw at your rack. And this was end of August, and it started already to be cool there because fall starts in September. And I started to worry terrible because if I won't have shoes and it will be so cold, it, I won't survive. So anyhow, there was a man there, and he came over. He was there a longer time, and he came over to my, to a friend of mine. We were together. He knew her from back home, and he says, "Well, I'm so sorry to hear what happened to your parents and the people which came." He told us right away. The ones we went, which went to the other lines, they are going to the gas chamber. You will never see them anymore in your life. And he, so he says, so we said, can you help us maybe with a pair of shoes, anything? So he gave me and her a pair of shoes. And then they marched us to the block. I was on block 20. The block was uh, one of this uh, little, it, uh, this little barrack, a barrack which can take uh, 200 people at least when they are squeezed in. There was no floor, just cement or everything bare. In the middle, they had something built like a long, long slo uh, stove. And there was one woman in charge. She was one of the ex-prisoners. And if anybody did not obey the rules just to behave and, and, and not, to, not to go out by themselves, all kinds of, there were all kinds of rules. And if anybody did not obey the rules, they were laid on this, on this stove and they were whipped. They were whipped by her? Yes. Now, at night, we were all laying on the cement floor and they threw us very thin little uh, cover blankets, but they were so thin and so shabby, so five people had to cover themselves with one of these blankets and everybody was Everybody was pulling a, a corner, but somehow, you know, in tragedy, people try to help each other. 
you know, it was not like one would take the half blanket or something, the other they should fight. No, it was very quiet. Everybody tried to do the best they can. And then in the morning they woke us up five o'clock. It was still dark. And we had to get out. And they, and they call it cellapel. They used to count us. It was just a routine of humiliation, of degradation, or to make the people suffer because, because it was not necessary. What is there to come? Who can run away there? We were there and this is it. But they had to count if everybody is inside. And this was going on through the whole camp. So in the morning it used to be like in the army barracks. Everybody had to go out in front of his barrack. And there were hundreds and hundreds of barracks and thousands and thousands and thousands of these prisoners were standing outside. No uniform, nothing, just in these clothes which they gave us. And they cut, and the SS people were walking around. And then they had secretaries, uh, former prisoners, and they were writing, this in this block, this so many people, and this, I, I couldn't look in what they wrote, but I presumed. And we were standing and standing and standing and standing. And it was very cold, terrible. It was so cold that we had to stay with our back to each other. We were warming each other this way. So they counted and counted and counted and counted. And sometimes there was a mistake or somebody was inside. Maybe a person was ill. They were not able to go out. But I don't know what was the reason. If in one of these barracks, in front of these barracks, the <coughs> figure was not right, we had to stay, sometimes for hours. Hours and hours and hours and are counting. After this, we, were, we, we went back in, and they brought some, some watery soup, and we were eating the soup. And then when we wanted to go to the restrooms, we couldn't go on our own. We had to go in, in groups, always with groups. And while we were going to the restrooms, this was the time when we could socialize. Uh, socialize in a way, we met other girls from different blocks. We didn't know who is there, who is not, who went to the, to the guest chamber, who, went, who was left behind, who, was, who went somewhere else because Auschwitz was uh, divided in different camps. I went to Birkenau. Mostly these people came to Birkenau, but still we didn't know who came and who is not and who is alive. So on the way, we met the people all, and hi, how are you? Are you here? What happened to your parents? And this and this. This is the way we could communicate. Otherwise, we, could, we had to stay in the block, in the barrack. I happen to be with people, uh, doctors, women doctors and nurses, which worked in the ghetto. We were 180 people in this barrack. Actually, the time when I came, Birkenau was a transit camp. The people which they had to take to the gas chamber, they took immediately. And the ones, the very young ones, and able to work after three days, they send them to different camps, either concentration camps or branches of concentration camp, labor camps. Uh, somehow I stayed about four weeks in Burkina. And it was close to the Jewish holidays. We didn't know if it's holiday, if it's day, if it's night, what day. We didn't know a thing. I didn't know the date. All I knew is the last time I came here was, was uh, August 28, 1944, and I didn't rem We counted the days, so we could figure out approximately. But uh, there were some people, I don't know how, maybe through the people which were there a longer time, they had some calendar or they knew. Maybe these people which worked there a longer time from the people which arrived when they, when they brought all their possessions, the possessions were you know, they had special rooms where they searched everything, all the clothes, they took out all the jewelry, and they separated books and clothes and shoes and all kinds of things. So maybe somebody found a calendar, and this is how they knew. But one day, on a Friday, I saw they brought in two candles, and 
Afternoon towards evening, they said, is Eve of, the, of Rosh Hashanah, and they are going to light candles, and they are going to make their prayers. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. How could they know? How could they get candles? But this was true. They brought candles, and they were starting making prayers. And suddenly I became very, very ill. Just shortly before they lit the candles, I was shivering and I was so sick. And I felt I was burning. Then I was very friendly with one of the young uh, women doctors. And she took me uh, across, was an ambulance, kind of a little hospital, and she took me there. And when I came, they took my temperature, they sent her back. They took my temperature and they said, right away they said, uh, after uh, two, three hours, that I have scarlet fever. And if I have scarlet fever, they have to take me to a special, uh, to a special quarantine, because this is a contagious disease. So I was thinking right away this, the special quarantine will be the gas chamber, because what do they need here quarantine for? What they take, uh, they take healthy people to the gas chamber. What are they going to do with uh, with people with diseases? What was the reason for keeping people with contagious diseases? I really cannot answer. All I know is they took me the following morning to a different camp. They call it the gypsy camp. They were gypsies, which had the same treatment as Jews. All were annihilated. They had very few gypsies left. They were burning them just like Jews. And they brought me there to a little hospital. When I came in, everybody spoke Polish there. There, was, there were two uh, prisoners, women, but they were from Poland, from Lodz. And I felt a little bit at ease because I could communicate, I mean, I could say a few words in my native language to them. And then they were little, very young kids I mean, girls from 12 till 18. The oldest person there was maybe 19 years old, but it began from 12. And how old were you then? I was, uh, let's see, 16 when the war broke out. I was about 18, 19 years old. They put me on a second-story second bank, a second bank, you know, they had banks. And I was so terribly weak, and I was running such a terrible fever that I could never walk down to the bathroom. I was falling down. I was just crawling. And one day when I walked down, this time I didn't fall, I just walked down, and I looked in the, in the window in the... And I, and I took a look in the window, and I couldn't believe my, in what I saw before my eyes. I saw myself, and I just couldn't believe that this is me. It was just a completely different person. I didn't have hair. I was terrible pale, and uh, big circles under my eyes. And I started to feel so sorry for myself. I said, I can't believe it's this me. It was just terrible. Anyhow, I was in this hospital uh, for about four weeks. During this time, every few days, I could see through the window wagons were coming in, black, big trucks covered with black military trucks. You couldn't look inside. Everything was black outside. And when the trucks were coming in, Dr. Mengele, which was one of the doctors in Auschwitz, very famous, and he was the one which uh, he was the one which is responsible for sending all these people to the gas chamber. So he came in with his lieutenants, and they we all had to go down from the banks, and they were looking at us. If they if they and then they picked at random people, the girls. Whoever they, they thought, I don't know if they were more, more sick, everybody was practically sick equally. 
maybe they were more skinny. I don't know what was their reason for picking them. So they picked certain girls, and they took them to a different room, and when we, no, they took us to a different room, and the girls were standing there. We didn't, we didn't know what would happen. After a few, they kept us in the other room for a few hours. We didn't hear noise, nothing. It was very quiet. I don't remember the distance from the room where they took us out to the room they took us in, but we couldn't hear noise or screaming, nothing, quiet. When we came in, the, the bunks of the girls which they took away were made. The room was quiet. Nobody was there. They took them away. Nobody said where, what, how. They disappeared. But we, we knew. Nobody said a word. Nothing. And this was going on for four and a half weeks, but every day was more than a year. It was just terrible. I was laying there in the fever. And I remember instead giving me medication, I used to get a half pill. A half pill, a half pill, a half pill. Very little food. A half pill. A pill. P I L L. A pill. A, med a, a medicine. medical pill. Mm -hmm. okay. How does it sound? Pillow? No, pill. I didn't know what. Excuse me. I didn't know for sure. I do the best I can. I'm That's sorry. all right. That's all right. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, after being there for about four weeks, there was a terrible commotion in the hospital. And they were telling us the hospital is being evacuated. It was such a big commotion that hundreds and hundreds of bottles of medicine were laying on the floor. And everything was such a rush. And they were taking out people, putting on trucks. And one of the women doctors walked over to me and says to me, uh, go into the room where they're giving clothes. You go, you're getting out from here. You're getting with the ones, you're getting out with the ones which are being released. As, as they are already, uh, you know, they went through the quarantine already. It means I am well enough to go back as a regular prisoner. So I was, and so I said to the doctor, I still run high fever. She said, don't say a word, just tell what I, do what I'm telling you, which was my luck that she told me to do this. I was very lucky. I mean, God was with me. Probably my parents were praying for me. I don't know, their souls. Because you had to be there six weeks, otherwise you carry germs. And the Nazis were very, very careful about, about cleanliness and spreading germs. Terrible. Before I went to the room to get the clothes, I picked up a bottle of pills. Somehow I knew which pill I'm getting, the color, this. I said, this must be the pills. And I took a jar of pills with me. I said, just in case, I will take the pills because I run fever still. So I take more pills. And I kept the pills, nobody saw, and I got the clothes. And they put us on, on the trucks, and we went back to Birkenau, to the, I suppose, I thought I'm going to the barrack back where I came from. But instead of going to the barrack, they brought the ones which were, which supposed to be already healthy, they brought us back to another hospital. Being there in the hospital, in the evening in Birkenau, they, they uh, took our temperature. And most of the girls did not have temperature because they were already six weeks in the hospital and they were already well. Well, to a certain degree, that they didn't carry the disease. Nobody was well there. And when they asked me to, luckily, nobody looked at my thermometer, but they came over and they said, did you have fever? I said, no, but I had very high fever. And when I saw I had this high fever, I took 10 pills in one time. I took the pills and water as much as I can drink. And the following mor morning, I didn't have fever anymore. Then they released me with the other girls, and they sent us to another uh, camp. This was a working camp in, in Auschwitz, where the trains are coming. This was a station where the... Clo again, it was not a station, but they had the rails there. 
And uh, they told us they are going to send us to Germany to work. But we had to wait. They said, well, 24 hours, maybe, maybe longer. But at this time, they said, you're going to work, you will get warmer clothes, and you will get a loaf of bread, and you will get some jam. So they put big, big tables with coats. All this clothes was taken away from the people which arrived, you know. This was our clothes, all the prisoners' clothes. But nevertheless, all tables with clothes, all tables with shoes, and all tables with dresses. And uh, I got a coat, a long warm coat, a dress, a pair of boots, and then they gave us striped jackets and striped hats, the uniform. And they gave me a number. My number was 700. The number was right here on the left side. But the trains didn't come, not after one day, not after two days, not after three days. This was October 1944. The, now I know. But before I didn't know, October 1944, the, the Nazis, the Wehrmacht, was losing on the Russian front. They knew they are losing the war already. This was just three months before the Russians liberated Eastern Europe. This was October. They liberated them beginning of January. It was a very short time. So they knew... But even so, they knew the Jewish question to uh, annihilate the remainder of the remaining part of the Jews, this had priority be even before the front. So in order to send the trains to the front for the, for the needs of the soldiers, they sent the trains to pick us up and go with the trains to Germany. This is why we had to wait three days for the trains. But actually, they needed the trains. They didn't send it to the soldiers. They sent the trains to pick up the Jews, to send them to Germany. And the, while we were waiting the three days, I was with two other girls on one bunk, sleeping, and they gave us one soup daily without a, without a spoon, without a fork. So we took a few sips. Each one took a little sip of this watery soup. And somehow we survived the three days. And then they, when the train came, they put us in the cattle trains, and we went to Germany, supposedly. We didn't know where we were going, going to, uh, to the working camps. This was the story. We were going to the working camps. On the way, we, th we were talking, we were worrying, we didn't know where we were going, what is going to be, how long it will take to the destination. We knew we were going through Czechoslovakia because we stopped in Morava Ostravska. And some Czech people were screaming, this is Morava Ostravska. And they threw some carrots in. They knew who is coming and they threw in some carrots for us. And from, uh, from uh, Czechoslovakia, we went to Austria. And from Austria, we went to Oberbayern. And we arrived in a city of Lansing, a very, very beautiful city surrounded with Alps. When we walked down from the train, we couldn't believe our eyes. The most, I never saw mountains, because where I come from, we didn't have mountains. Here we came out in this cold, cold morning, and we saw beautiful Alps with snow peaks on top, and beautiful homes carved in the mountains, beautiful views, and SS women and SS men were waiting for us, older SS men. These were Austrian people. These people were drafted in Austria to the SS. They spoke a little, a little different accent, and they were older, older people, the men, the SS men. And they had dogs, they had machine guns, and the women were dressed just like SS, the SS women in uh, Germany. Then they asked us, they didn't know where we come from. They knew they are getting people for work. We were 500 women, 
410 Hungarian women and 90 girls from Poland. So they said, where do you come from? How come you look like this? So we told them where we came from. And they took us, took us to a place called Lansing. It was a city which was converted to factories during the war. The whole city was factories. Um, this was um, uh, Lansing Selvole Fabriken. These were uh, factories which were manufacturing uh, fabrics for German, uh, for Nazi uniforms and uh, sheets, linens, and etc. And mostly the people which were working there were uh, slave workers from Europe. And uh, the majority of people were not uh, people from concentration camps. They were in labor camps there. So we were 500, uh, 500 concentration, concentration camp prisoners being sent to this factory. Going to the place where they are they supposed to give us our quarters, we were marching through forests, miles and miles and miles and miles, and then we saw in the forest thousands and thousands and ten thousands of barracks, and then we saw outside people were standing, so we could understand that these are where we could see because we recognize how Polish people look and how Russian look and how other people look, we could see that these are uh, people which they send away for work, but they were not in ca concentration camps, they were in working camps. In other words, they were free to move around freely, and they were not surrounded with any wires, and they were not watched, they were watched in a way, but uh, it was not slave, slavery, uh, slave camps. So they were looking at us because we were the slaves, the way we looked and the way they matched us with the dogs and with the machine guns and with the SS people. So they knew that we are people from concentration camp, but they were not allowed to say a word for us, to us, no. They were just looking and, and shaking with their head. And then we came to a place, it used to be before a factory, and they converted this factory and these were our quarters in this factory. They had bus, they had uh, uh, shower rooms, but uh, the water was ice cold. We didn't have any water, and it started to be very, very, very cold, and we had to wash ourselves with this water. And then they had the bunks inside. Two, two girls had to share one bunk, and we had like two rows of bunks, and in the middle was a little stove. And then they, they made groups and they started to, se to send out these groups to work. In the morning, everybody had to get up very early. They counted us outside. The same, a similar routine as in uh, Birkenau, but it was a little bit more modified. It, did, it didn't last so long because we had to go to work. And then they made them in uh, like uh, seven, eight in a row, and we started to march. We marched in the middle. The SS men with the dogs and machine, side, and machine guns on the side, and the SS women beside them. And every morning, where, from the place where we marched out, there were homes where civilian people were living, Austrian people. They could see what's going on. Every day you had a show. 500 women prisoners are walking with, this, with the guards every single day. So everybody saw. They couldn't say we didn't know, we didn't see, because we were just in the heart of the village where people lived. And they saw what's going on. But nobody, nobody budged, nobody said, said they were, nobody came close. We were, just, we were just on our own, surrounded with the Nazis and with the dogs and with the machine gun. We did not have electric wires. They were three rows of very tall wires, but they were not electric wires, because it used to be a factory before, and they, it seems they didn't have time to put up the electric wires. It was already towards the end of the war. And w we marched several, 
several miles to the city of Lansing, because these were the suburbs. Lansing was all factories, and the people were, were living in the forest and outside the city. So the march took a good hour and a half, at least, and it started to snow. You know, winter comes very early to uh, Austria. This was Oberdonau, you know. Uh, it's much colder there in October already. It's just as cold as, as here back east in the winter. Snow was falling already, big snow. And here we, we were walking, marching, and uh, the, majority of, uh, the majority of us had wooden soles, and the snow was sticking to the soles, and people were falling, and it was just terrible. Okay. And when the people were falling, they were pushing them and beating them up. And finally, we came to the factory. But I somehow got what's with me. Uh, do you want me to change the subject to something else? No. Somehow God was with me all the time, but in this case, I was not lucky enough to go to the factory to work. They took a group of 31 people, 31 women, and we were, uh, they call it a commando, a group, which were digging ditches in the camp, where the, in the camp, in the forest, where the slave workers were the people which came from Europe, Russian prisoners of war, Poles, which were forced to labor, Italian, French, Yugoslavian, Hungarian, from all uh, uh, Belgium, uh, from Holland, from all over Europe, you had workers there. They were uh, over a 100,000. So I worked there with 30 women digging ditches because they needed to put some electric wires through. And the ground was very, very hard. We had to dig and dig and dig and dig. And snow was falling and rain was falling. And we, were, we had to stay and work all day long. And the day when it was a lot of snow, a lot of rain, we came back. Our clothes was completely soaked. And there was no other clothes to change. Then we tried to take off the clothes and dry it on the little stove. But we were so many girls, so the stove could take so much. So we can't change one day, this one put down one day, this. But uh, in the morning I got up and my clothes were still wet. And I still had to wear this wet clothes until it... So we were lucky sometimes it snowed again, so it got more wet. And sometimes it didn't snow, so it took a few days until it dried on our bodies. And we did not realize there were other camps. We thought we are the ones which, uh, which are here to work. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know the war is going to an end. But once in a while, we had foremen. Uh, German older people, uh, na uh, Nazis, not in uniform, and they were, you know, they were um, directing the work, what people should do in this and this. Once, once in a while they were throwing in, you know, oh, uh, his son was killed on the front, and this and this. One of them used to say sometimes, because he was angry, his, his sons were killed, you know, on the front. He said, well, Maybe it won't take long, you know. He used to throw, throw in a word here and there. But in the last week, somehow you could feel in the air something was going on. First of all, when, when the girls were going to work, and the other workers were working not far from them, even though each group of our people in the factory, I didn't experience this because we were digging the ditches 30 together. And we had a few, a few SS men and a few SS women, a few of these German foremen with us. But we did not have contact with any other people. But the girls which were in the factories, they saw the other workers. And they knew more because they were more free. So they used to slip through a little note to them. And it said, it's the war is going to the end. And this and this, sometimes they, send, they gave them a cigarette, sometimes they gave them a piece of apple or a piece of bread. They were, they were lucky enough to get these contacts in the, in the front of the Nazis. But somehow they did it while they worked. 
uh, let's say they put something in the machine, with the machine came out a little note. And we knew something is going on. Towards the end, we didn't get food. And I cannot begin to tell you what was going on. It was just terrible. We were walking out, and we were picking grass, and we were picking anything. If the, the grass was already bare, we did, there was nothing to pick anymore. This was going on for three days, and the Nazis ran away. We were left alone, but you couldn't, the camp was locked. You couldn't get out. There were tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, gates and tremendous walls. But when we looked outside, we saw other, we saw other uh, people watching us. These were Hungarian Nazis, the Panther Brigade. When the Nazis ran, over, uh, ran away, the Hungarians, which were, uh, this was a special battalion which was fighting with the German Wehrmacht, and they were, they were standing there. They, the Nazis sent them, and they stood there watching us with, with machine guns. We couldn't go out still until one day in the evening. The Hungarians were still outside in Hungarian uniforms. We saw, we didn't see any tanks, nothing. We just saw an American, a, a six foot, over six foot young man walked in, blonde, tall. We didn't see tanks, nothing. He just walked in and what he saw, he started to cross himself. And he couldn't speak English, but we could see that this is a different uh, uniform, this must be, we didn't know if he's English, if he's American. And right after he walked out, and then we ran outside and we saw a few tanks, just a few, maybe three. And we saw, we saw U.S., it was on the tanks. Then we started to scream, American soldiers are here, we are free. What they did is um, they ran into their to their uh, tanks, and they brought in the rations of their food. And we started, you know, everybody's got a little bit of food, they didn't have too much. And then after this, uh, you know, this was like a, uh, it was not a, for, how do you call it? It's like a, you know, when the brigade is approaching a certain city, and then they have to, like a forefront of the army, right? And after this, it took all night. They were just the three tanks in this particular spot. You didn't see anything else. Uh, afterwards, the, the Americans were driving in with their tanks, and they told us, you are free. And they brought, they brought in food, and they opened the gates, and they opened the doors, and we could go out. We could go out. Where can you go? Uh, right away, you know, you could see they opened the windows in the factories and we could see rays of sh sun coming in. And they didn't have, you know, you didn't have stores there, nothing. And they had just the food which they had, you know, military food, cans mostly and so on. And they didn't carry supplies. They didn't know there was going to be a camp. Because uh, later on, while we were there, we didn't know. We were a branch of the concentration camp Mauthausen. Mauthausen was the main camp, and they had so many different camps around, you know, uh, labor camps. And we were one of the labor camps, a branch of Mauthausen. Later on, after the war, when I came to visit Mauthausen mm -hmm. several years ago, and they have a brochure. They gave me my brochure, and I found in the brochure, I knew it before, but actually I found evidence, you know, Lansing was one of the branches of Mauthausen, and this is where I was. So, after two days, the American Red Cross, the army, the, uh, the, the unit of the army, but the Red Cross, took over charge of us. And they established, uh, is it late? We have about five more minutes. Okay. But if you need it, 
I am. We will get another role. We can then okay, take well, it to the next role. It's up to you. Yeah. You should please continue. Yeah. So, is it already so far? So far? I still have, yeah. Is that so? No, if time, nece time if necessary, we'll yeah. give you more time. But okay. uh, this role may okay. need to be replaced. So, they did not have their own food. You know, they gave us all the supplies they could, which was wonderful. All the cans, you know, everything was gobbled up immediately. And they opened a little ambulance because some girls which were in such terrible shape they couldn't eat. They, they had diarrhea. And some of them died there because they overate. So they made a little ambulance and they took in, they took in all these people which, uh, which were very weak and very sick. And they started to feed them with a different diet. Now, every morning they went out to the villages and brought in fresh, fresh food for us. Fresh milk, fresh eggs, fresh chicken, fresh, everything fresh. And they established their own military kitchen, and they cooked, they cooked for us. So we had a very good food, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And they posted military personnel around, around the factory, around the camp, MPs, military personnel. And nobody was allowed to get into the camp because they were... You know, they were war watching, we were young women, nothing, no harm should be done to us. And then we saw all these this slave laborers were coming down here because they were free too. And they knew we were, you know, we were, uh, this was a concentration camp, and they all came to see us, but they couldn't get in. It was all military police, and we were watched. And later on, they took us in the army trucks, and they took us with uh, American flags, and we were driving through the whole city, free. It's just unbelievable. And thousands okay. and thousands of people, including these slave workers, mm -hmm. everybody was piled in, in the trucks, and we were driving around for days. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And being there, okay, so have to stop. Very good. Let's stop now. Okay. Take a break. They'll put in a new, okay. new role. Um, we are ready to start, so please continue where you left off, and then later on okay. you'll tell us more about uh, your what we were la uh, what we were uh, where we were left off. Uh, I will never forget the wonderful, tender care we received from the American Red Cross. It just unbelievable what they didn't do to us really they took care of us like uh, family take care of children wonderful care wonderful so uh, they established a kitchen in the camp it was no more camp we were free but we didn't have room where to go and the American occupied forces did not have a tendency to evacuate families, Austrian or German families, in order to accommodate us. These were civilized people and they set an example to the free world, how, how people behave. So we stayed in the camp, naturally under different conditions. We, were, we had soap and we had water and we, they brought, I received six pairs of shoes and fabric for blouses and skirts and right away we look civilized really and we had very good food slowly we didn't eat they didn't give us uh, fattening things you know they had special dietitians to feed us and the and the, the very sick ones were in a special hospital little hospital and we stayed there about 10 days after 10 days they evacuated us uh, about 15, 20 miles away to the most beautiful resort. And they had a beautiful lake there. They call it the Arthur Sea. Uh, so the, the lake was surrounded with the Alps, the most beautiful view in the world to me. Can I ask you, what, what did you feel like when you came after everything you'd been through? and you? I felt elated. I was... I knew I lost my parents. I didn't count on them. Uh, my brothers ran away on the Russian side. They were not in concentration camp. 
said I had a ray of hope. Maybe my brothers were coming. But deep in my heart, I did not want to go back to Poland. I did not want to go back to this blood-soaken earth. Eh? So I stayed on. First of all, I had to recuperate uh, physically and mentally. Mentally, I was pretty good adjusted, I have to say. Just, just very sad in a way, but pretty good adjusted. And they took us to the most beautiful resort where Hitler Nazi Jugend had a summer camp. These were cottages in a forest, not far from the lake, surrounded with the Alps. The most, I was always a, a nature lover. I loved beautiful views and geography. And when I saw this, I said, if there is paradise, it's probably it. And it is the most beautiful part, part of the world. If you ever go there, you will see it. And we stayed there several weeks in this camp. In not camp, in this resort. And the same thing, military police surrounded the whole the whole um, village, outsiders could not get in because all other camps were open and people started to run out. I mean, they didn't tell you, you can come in and you can come out. When the Americans drove in and they liberated a city and they opened the camp, if you want, you are on their own. Go wherever you want. They didn't tell you, come 3 o'clock, come 4 o'clock, come 5 o'clock. Nobody went. There was no no strength to go, no way to go, no place to go. But if you want, you are on the own. For our own sake, we stayed on, you know, just to recuperate. So we stayed there under very, very good conditions. Again, they, they had their own kitchen for us. And once a week, we had a dance. They played the band. And the sad part of the story, we couldn't communicate with the soldiers. We didn't speak, we didn't know how to speak English, so we were made signs, you know. We made signs and we could dance, but uh, we couldn't communicate. There were some girls from Hungary and from uh, Austria. They spoke English, and as a matter of fact, one of the girls which was with me in the camp from Vienna, she married the lieutenant of the American Red Cross, and I remember his name. His name was Mr. Chive. So this Mr. Chive took me and two other girls, a delegation, to another camp. They brought a list of other former prisoners and how to get in touch with, with other people, you know. So this way people found each other. And I went to Ebenze, and this was the camp where my husband was. All the same kids <coughs> was in the same camp. They didn't know each other at this time. And I went to Ebenze, and I couldn't believe my eyes what I saw there. Piles and piles and piles of bodies. And people, men's, men walking around like skeletons. I saw a lot, I saw an awful lot during the war and in the ghetto. And I in, in Auschwitz, but what I saw there was just beyond description. I cannot, I cannot describe this. The most awesome, the most cruel, song, the most horrible, mm. the most horrible thing what I saw. Anyhow, we came in there to the office, and I brought a list of the women which survived in my camp, and they gave us a list of the people which are there, because the Germans. Everything was very much organized, very precise. Every name was listed. So we, we exchanged lists. And some of the girls found their brother or a husband and or so on. And uh, after a while, another group went. And one of my friends from the camp met my husband. She knew him from before the war. And she, uh, she told him, there is a lot of people, some of the people from your hometown, why don't you come over someday for a visit? And he came with another guy one day to visit. They, got, they had to get a special pass to go in. You just couldn't get in. Because a lot of men after the war, you know, you never know. Everything was beautifully organized, just magnificent. So we stayed there in the fresh air. And girls, you know, people started to gain weight a little bit. 
and started to be stronger from day to day. It's amazing how a person can, especially young people, what good nutrition and peace and 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 surroundings, how it can influence a person. They were, they started to come back to life just like a just like a flower. Mm -hmm. Every day a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And they started to look human already. Hair started to grow and nice and the people started to make plans what to do. Some some tried to go back home to Hungary or to Poland and some didn't want to go back, like me. I planned to go abroad. I had relatives here in uh, in uh, South America in the United States in uh, South America in uh, United States and I said I will try to get in touch I don't know how but I have enough I'm not going back then I have to start a new life and so on and then my husband came and I started to date in the beginning I wasn't interested <laughs> to date steady really because I was very uh, I made up my mind and I was very, very serious about it just to travel abroad on my own and just start new, get in touch with my relatives. But then I started to date my husband and I changed my mind, it seems. And at this time, the uh, Jewish brigade, the Haganah, came to our camp. The Haganah was the the Palestine brigade attached to the English and they were the ones which tried to take out the people who survived the camps to bring them illegally to Israel and I changed my mind to go to uh, the States and I decided I will go to Palestine with my husband and we were already on our way we came to Italy and we were waiting to uh, to get a ship because they uh, they didn't have ships. They have to organize ships, buy ships. And this was in 1945, in August, end of August. I was six weeks in Italy, waiting to go to Palestine. And uh, after six weeks, I met some people, a friend of ours, who left before World War II, he graduated from school, got his diploma, and went to Israel, and he became an officer in the army. At this time was Palestine. And he found out in Italy through somebody that I am alive, and I am in Italy, in this, in this place, and he came to see me. It was quite a reunion. And at this time, while I was in Italy, my brother came from Russia, and he was in the... Polish army which liberated Eastern Europe and he came home to see me to see the parents and the family in end of December 1944 beginning of January before even they liberated our city but the Nazis already ran away my brother got a special permit from General Rokosowski he was a lieutenant in the army and he walked about 20 miles with his machine gun, his uniform, to come home. There was nothing. And uh, then he came to the city of Lodz. He was stationed there. And the people which were liberated by the Russians, they didn't have the tender, the tender loving care as we did. They were just, they let them out and they were free on their own. So everybody came back to his hometown to see whom he, he can find. This was the point where everybody gathered, and they had the Jewish community, and everybody registered, and this is how people found each other, because everybody was dispersed. And my, my brother met some people which were in Auschwitz, and they were girls which were with me. And they told him, you cannot count on your sister. She had scarlet fever, and they burned down this whole hospital. She is not there anymore. So naturally he was terrible, sad, he was crying day and night because we were extremely close. And finally one day he got the news, some boys came from Italy, that 
they met a mutual friend who is an officer in the Haganah, and he sends uh, news that I am alive. And he just couldn't believe it. And later on, when I wrote a letter to him, and the guy brought the letter, he says, well, it's a nice letter, but this is not my sister. My sister is not alive. He couldn't believe it. After he, he had details, because I was at the last moment with these people which saw me, what was going on. He says, no, she's not alive. But uh, being in Italy, after five and a half, six weeks, we were kind regimented there, because we were kind prepared to go to Palestine, and life at this time there was not easy. So they prepared us to be more regimented to, like in the kibbutzim, you know, more, more uh, communal work and everything done together and so on. But after a few weeks and being in camp, and getting to know this type of life, we realized that really this is not what, what we like. This won't fit with the lifestyle we like to lead. There's, we did not make a, we did not plan to have a bed of roses immediately. We knew you are alone, you don't have anything, and you have to stand on your own feet, you have to work. But somehow this type of, uh, of communal Life did not appeal to us, and we changed our mind. You too much you couldn't get over the effect of camp life. I did not like the camp life, and we made uh, our mind up, and we turned around. Uh, naturally, you were free. You were, after the war, you were free, whatever you did, with uh, being, uh, being uh, whoever took care of you, is it the Haganah or the Palestine Brigade or whoever, you are free. You don't want to take it, you just leave it. And after several, six weeks, we turned around and we went back to Germany. We really didn't know where we were going. Oh, we picked a city. Maybe we go to Stuttgart. We knew there is some, a lot of people in Stuttgart, you know, people who survived the camp. Maybe here, maybe there. I told my husband-to-be, I said, well, we pick a nice city. I don't like to go to ugly cities. And, I, and all these people, you see, my story is maybe different than other stories because I was liberated in a camp with 500 women, but there were camps with 50,000 and 30,000, and, and the occupied forces, we were occupied by United States forces, some were, occupi some were uh, occupied by uh, English, some were liberated by French. So each, uh, each, uh, each t territory had different rules, you know, and they could do for the, for the ex-prisoners so much. When you approach 500 people, you can give them different care. When, they, when you approach, approach 40,000, it's much more difficult. And their, their, their conditions were different, too. So they could help them in a certain way, they, like they couldn't help us. To us, it was easier, you know. So we had more care. If you have to disperse uh, charity for... 50,000 people, or you have to disperse for 500, so the 500 get more. So our experience was much, besides being free, the experience of being really taken care of with such, with such attention was much more, much, much more. And it was, it was much easier to get rehabilitated, you know. The shock was not so great. It was even, such... Even so. <laughs> I, I after the war. I want we, the shock was great to a way up to pleasantness more because every day was getting better. Every day, every day was better and better and better. So anyhow, coming back to Germany after being in Italy, this is a very interesting part of my story. All the people which survived the camps didn't have money, didn't have means, didn't have a place where to go. You, can, you couldn't go into a German and kill him and throw him out because the military government, the American military government, did not allow this. We don't go tooth for a tooth. We are a civilized country, and we and their rules, their rules were civilized rules. Even though the Nazis were the way they were, but we cannot go down to their level. Our levels were the American levels, and the and the free world levels were different than the Nazis. So you couldn't go to somebody and kill him and throw him out. 
even though they were Nazis. You did not have a right. The law had to be taken care of the American occupied forces. They had to take law in their hands. Otherwise, it would be a revolution. People were, would be killed. They would kill each other on the streets. Anyhow, so, excuse me, I have to finish. Okay. So all these people had to be in different camps again. I don't know what was there before, but the people were concentrated in, f in open camps, waiting what is going to be with them. In the meantime, the Jewish agents stepped in, like the UNRWA and the Hayas and the, no, the joint. UNRWA was uh, from United, uh, United Nations Rehabilitation Agency. And then we had the, the Jewish groups were coming, also military, but they were connected with the joint and with the had, uh, Hayas. And this was already, they brought help too. So everybody could, so mu could do so much. There were tens of thousands of people. They couldn't supply everybody. So all together did help them. But for the time being, they were concentrated again in a camp. It was a free camp, but we are again in a camp. And when I saw a camp, I was running. I couldn't take it. I hated it. So we came there on the way going. We picked a city because we came back from Austria from Italy with some boys which were in uh, Stuttgart, Germany, and they were traveling back and forth. So they told us there is a, a lot of uh, people, survivors in Stuttgart. It's a, nice, it's a nice city, and how about going to Stuttgart? As we said, fine, we will go to Stuttgart. But on the way we stopped, there was a big camp uh, of the you know, people which were liberated, Feldapping, not far from Munich. And we met some people which we knew, and they said, why don't you stay here? I said, no, I can I didn't tell them the reason. But I just couldn't stand, stand uh, camp life at all. It was just too much. Here I am liberated. It's a f I'm a free, and I'm going to be in a camp again, a free camp. I don't want camp. The word camp was, was murder to my ears. just couldn't take it. So anyhow, we met a man, who a friend of my husband from before the war, and he says he li they live in a city not far from Munich. It's a small, beautiful city. It's a city of uh, churches, and miracles happen in this city. It's an old, beautiful city. And there is 120 survivors, which they survived different camps, you know, around also working camps. And they gathered in this city, and they live in a, the military government, uh, took a hotel, you see, legally. They, everything was done legally. They uh, resettled the Nazis which owned the hotel. They emptied it. And they resettled the survivors in this hotel. There were 120 people. And when we came, we had to register. They couldn't register new people. There was no room. It was not easy. You can stay, but where are you going to stay? Then it's again a problem. In the uh, American uh, military officials were working with the new German officials. They were ex-Nazis or they were new Nazis, but new Germans, they were not Nazis at this time, maybe before. They were, they didn't know, Hitler and the Nazis were dead. There was a new Germany. Then they had to bring representatives. Later on, this is a different subject, how the Nazis were re nazis rehabilitated. But they had to work with officials from, from the former, from Germany. Somebody had to, you know, had to co-work with them because they were certain part of, uh, of administrations that the American occupied forces couldn't do it themselves. They had to work with the Germans somehow. So it was very difficult to register in a small city. You could register if I would go to the camp where they have 10,000 people, 8,000 people. What was the people. name of that little small city? Altetting. Altetting. A-L-T-O-T-T-I-N-G. But the O has two dots on the top. Altetting. Oberbayern. And this was a city of miracles, you know. People used to come miles and miles and miles away with crosses. And they were, they were crawling on their knees around the a holy place where miracle, miracle used to happen. And in the morning the church bells were, were ringing and they had beautiful museums, 
the panorama, you know, the birth of Christ, excellent museum, marvelous. It was a very cultured, beautiful city, and lots of trees, and it was a really calm. It was a calmness took me around when I came there. It was good for my soul to be in the surroundings. Uh, when I saw Kim, I can come, I can visit for a day, I couldn't. I couldn't stay. Please forgive me for yes, now you interrupting can. you, but I, we have very little time, and I yeah. want to know whether you ever saw your brother again. I will come to this. But we only have Why? a few more minutes. A few more minutes. I will make it fast. Okay. Uh, one of the boys, people were traveling all the time, legally or illegally. In the beginning, it was not so hard even to go on the Russian side. So one of the boys, which lived in the hotel with 120 people, went to Poland, and he met my brother, and he told him, I knew he's going to Poland, and I knew where my brother is in the city. And I said, this is the letter, and you just go there, and you just tell him I'm here. In the beginning, he didn't believe it. He crossed his heart, he cried, he swore, so he's there. And, but my brother couldn't see me. He was an officer, a big officer in the Russian army, Polish army. But when he found out I'm alive, he wrote letters to the general that he wants to come and see me, he wants to retire from the army and so and so. And one day he ran away. He deserted. He deserted and uh, he was already in the forest where they, they caught him. And my, my brother would be killed immediately for desertion. But somehow he ran away in, in a forest so deep and he stood there a few days and he twisted his ankle and when he back, came back to the army, he says he rode a horse and he twisted his arm because they didn't know whom they were chasing. So he stopped doing this and he says if he will leave the army, he will leave legally and he wrote a letter. He went to Warsaw to the big general. He told him he lost the whole family and this and this. And by miracle he was released and he came legally, legally with a transport to Germany and he, I got a wire one day that he is in this, in this camp in Germany with the people which came from the Russian side. Also, this was also arranged with the Haganah. The Haganah were pulling out people from the Russian side, from all the sides they were interested to bring as many people to Palestine as possible. And I came this, into this camp. It was by... Uh, the, uh, by the Czechoslovakian Chos border. So they were sleeping in tents. There were thousands and thousands of people. I came. Uh, he came uh, with his, uh, with his uh, fiancée, with his wife to be. This is the first time I met him. And immediately, my husband was at this time in Munich. I took a taxi with somebody else because he had somebody else too. And, we, and I told the driver, you drive fast. It took us maybe three quarters of a day to come there, and uh, right away I took them out, and I brought them there to Altetting, and we had one huge room, and they stayed with us for three months. Your, your brother and his wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after this, in the meantime, my husband made contact with yeah. his family here, and mm -hmm. they already we already had papers coming to United States, but so many people. At this time, the quotas were, uh, were very much restricted, and they let, let in 100,000 uh, survivors. And even so, we had uh, all the papers necessary. They stopped the immigration. We had, to, we had to wait three years on our luggage. In the meantime, my brother went back to Poland, and uh, he started some business there. And from Poland, he went to Israel. And from Israel, I brought them here, and we are together. In Los Angeles. Yes. And we are always together. The best, he's my brother, he, they ask me if I have, I have wonderful friends, but my best friend is my brother. Mm -hmm. We are one. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. And mm -hmm. I'm very lucky, I'm happy. Very. Two more minutes. Yeah. You have two more minutes. You want to tell us some more. Oh, tell, tell you some more. Well, we came here and about your family right now. Your husband, your children. Yeah, I have one daughter. I have one daughter, and she was a school teacher. Right now, she's getting her master's in family therapy, and she's a lovely young lady, very pretty. 
And I'm very, very lucky. I have my family. I count my blessing. The little family I have. In this whole world, I have one cousin in uh, Israel, first cousin, and I have two, two stepbrothers, which I, I knew them not too much, because they were abroad all the time. Uh, one is in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and one lives in France. They have beautiful families. We saw each other. I visited them. They visit me, and I visit them. But my closest person in this world, besides my own immediate family, is my brother. And he's a great source of my uh, comfort and my, and, uh, my strengths. And he reminds you of everyone else. We have a lot in common, and we talk a lot about the past, mm -hmm. which I don't like to talk with anybody else. And uh, we talk about the present and the future, and he's a lot of strength to me, because I'm very private. Thank you very, very much. No, I like to add, even yes. if it takes two minutes, I yes. hope that is enough. All right. I like to add my sincere thanks to the faculty of UCLA for helping us, the 1939 Club, to go through with this project of taping the story of the Holocaust so the future generation will know about this, what we went through, and they will fight bigotry and they will learn about it. And how free people should respect each other and should, there should be a better world for the future generation. I also like to thank my interviewer, Dr. Morris Beckwith, for the wonderful cooperation and kindness, and uh, Dr. Janet Haddad. Thank you very much.